Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. Our scripture reading today comes from 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 22 of the Common English Bible. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place as my house of sacrifice. When I close the sky so there is no rain, or I order the locusts to consume the land, or I send a plague against my people, if my people who belong to me will humbly pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land." From now on, my eyes will be open and my ears will pay attention to the prayers offered in this place because I have chosen this temple and declared it holy so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you will walk before me just as your father David did, doing all that I have commanded you and keeping my regulations and case laws, Then I will establish your royal throne, just as I promised your father David. You will never fail to have a successor ruling in Israel. But if any of you ever turn away from and abandon the regulations and commands that I have given you and go to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot you from my land that I gave you, and I will reject this temple that I made holy for my name. I will make it a joke insulted by everyone." Everyone who passes by this temple so lofty now will be shocked and will wonder, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and temple? The answer will come because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt. They embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. This is why God brought all this disaster on them. May God bless your hearing, your understanding, and application of scripture today. Amen. Good morning, church. It's great to be with you. I'm Pastor Harold. Welcome to those who are listening on demand or online. We're glad you're with us today. We are in a message series titled 40 Days of Prayer. This is part six of seven. Today's message is titled How to Pray for Healing and Restoration. Really important message, I think, for all of us. To think about because when you look around the world today i think everybody and this has been the consensus since i was born is the world needs a spiritual awakening you know that the, you look at the challenges in ukraine and russia china the middle east the tornadoes that took place over the last few days in alabama mississippi you look at all the turmoil going on in the world even, even in our own city in st louis and all the you know all the Destruction and the shootings and the violence. It's just every day. Every day. And so the argument is we need a, we need a, a huge revival. We need a huge spiritual awakening, a huge spiritual transformation, a spiritual experience, if you would. That's why the, the movements that are going on right now in our culture with the Jesus Revolution and the Asbury Revival, now you're starting to have other revivals going on. I saw a few posted today where it's a 72-hour revival, where a 48-hour revival. Churches are doing this, trying to bring people together, just get a lot of people together praying. And uh, so important. Um, I think it's hard to deny that our culture, our world that we live in, is outside the will of God. If you paid any attention to that scripture we just got done reading, which we'll unpack a little bit today. If you have your lesson plans, I encourage you to open them up now or take them out of your bulletin. We're going to be referring to those. Inside your bulletin is a space to take some extra notes because I will give you some stuff that's not in the bulletin to write down. Um, If you're online listening, you can go to our website. There's a tab titled Lesson Plans and Bulletins. You can go down to today's date and print that off in PDF and have that as a tool to go through this message. I encourage you to use the handout. Uh, It's the way to get the most out of today's message and take notes and where you can keep the message alive Throughout the week, as you go through your week, you can refer back to it, study it, pray it, live it, ultimately. So when we think about praying for restoration, right, we all have needs. And it's really easy to pray for physical stuff. And we heard a lot of that today. Pray for our health, pray for this person, that person. 
But there's all kinds of things we need restoration in. It's not just physical, but it's mental. A lot of us are going through a lot of mental anguish or mental trauma, emotional problems, relational problems. We're having relationship problems with our children. Maybe our marriage is in trouble. Finances. Maybe the finances are completely upside down. You don't know how you're going to even pay next week's, next month's bills. I mean, there's just all over the place. I get these calls and I've been through all this stuff in my own life. Sometimes we just need restoration of our minds. Our minds just need to be restored. But wherever you're at, this message today has a lot of hope, but it also has a huge, huge lesson in it. Multiple lessons, but really one keystone lesson. And then we're really going to hit on that lesson hard. Because we're quick to pray for healing and restoration, but we're not quick to live into the premise behind it. And so I want to get into that today. Your scripture that you see in your handout, here it is, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Um, we can do a whole sermon series just on this one passage of scripture. It's full of promises, it's full of lessons and blessings, but I want to read it to you and just listen to it. If, right off the bat, the word if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, you might want to circle that word humble and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from they I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land and I would encourage you to circle that word heal second chronicles 7 14 that's a, a, a promise was well, full of promises but it's a huge one blanket promise that's thousands of years old right there Thousands of years old, that promise is. And, uh, but what we have to learn, and this is going to be the foundation of everything we talk about today. If there's a promise, there's a premise. And I hope you write that down. If there's a promise, there's a premise. Or you can write, there's a promise, there's a principle, which means there's an action I need to live into. It means I have to participate in the promise. You know, I have, I have a role to play. And so we're going to look at the conditions of that. But, it, but just looking at that scripture alone, number one, if, is right off the bat. If my people. So the big question is if I do this or not. Meaning I have say so. I have, I have a choice to, to say yes or no to this, to this promise. But it's not for everybody. Because not everybody's going to do what God's asking them to do. So it's just not a, a blanket promise for everybody in the world. It says, if my people who are called by my name. So it's not for everybody. It's those who have been called, who answer the call. It takes two to say yes to a relationship. God already said yes before you were born. But if you've said yes to God, this is what God is saying. If my people who are called by name will humble themselves, then I will hear and seek my face and I will hear from them. They will hear from me. So that's really important that we get that. And then you have Mark 3 8 reminds us of this. Now I'll step over here. It says, If anyone is ashamed of me in my words in this unfaithful and immoral generation, I will be ashamed of them when I return in glory with all my angels. So if you're not seeking, if you're hiding that you're a Christian, if you're just trying to be a casual Christian, a lone ranger Christian, you know, there's nothing, nobody would really know that you're following Jesus other than, you know, if they came to church on Sunday and saw you. Kind of like our lead-in video, our Easter invite. Dude, you go to church? I didn't know you go to church. That, that kind of thing. You know, then, then this is how God will respond to that. So do you let people know what you're about, who you're following, who you put your faith and trust in? Does people know you're a believer? In Christ. It's important. So we're going to get to, down to it. But I, before we move on. I just want to remind everybody again. Every promise. There is a premise. And that's what we're going to really hammer home today. That behind everything we're going to unpack. There's a, there's a pro, you know, I'm, I want all this stuff to happen. But there's a premise. I need to be doing that. So the ultimate question is. If you had to personalize it today. What is going on in your life. That needs to be restored. Is it your marriage? Is it your finances? Is it your, just your personal relationship with God? Is it your health? Is it your mental health? Is it your emotional health? Some relationships that have gone astray? 
What is it? Or it could be multiple things, of course. But what is it? What needs to be restored? Well, to be humble, there's four conditions that have to be met. And that's what we're going to unpack. So here's number one. Admit, I'm not in control. This sounds easy. Most people will never do it. In recovery circles, you have the 12 steps. And there's over 300 12-step programs in the world today that follow the 12 steps. And step one is, I admit it, I am powerless, fill in the blank. Over whatever. Alcohol, drugs, sex, food, anger. Just fill in the blank. But the the first step to have victory is I have to admit that that I'm not in control. I'm not in control of anything. My life's unmanageable. That is a huge, huge thing. That's, That's step one of this process. And it even tells us that in our scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And we've just read it, but it's, if my people will humble themselves. And the first step to humbling ourselves is that we have to admit that we are not in control. That I am powerless over the people, places, and things in my life, circumstances. And I may have things in my life that are totally I'm enslaved to that I can't let go of. And the first step to getting healed from that and overcoming that is I have to admit I'm not in control. So the call for humility is step one. And, uh, and so if you had to define humility, there's lots of definitions. Einstein gave us one. There's lots of my, my good friend Dan Kent wrote a book called Confident Humility. I encourage you to download that and get that book and add it to your library. In that book, he talks about two ditches of humility. And so I'll let you read that for yourself. Great book. It's only a few years old. But Dan's a good friend of mine out of Minnesota. Teaches at Bethel Seminary. And uh, excellent, excellent teacher. But he wrote that book. But I think if you had to just summarize it, and what does it mean to be humble? It means that I'm more focused on God than I am myself. I'm more focused on God's will in my life than myself. Thy will not mine, be done, is the premise with which I live by. Hard to do in America, friends. Let's be real. It is. We got all the gadgets. We got all the TV channels. We got all the stuff. We don't have anybody getting in our way. We can come to church and worship. We don't have people walking around with machine guns on the streets. Some of the schools do. Some of the hospitals do, it seems like. There are armed guards everywhere, but more and more we're getting like that, but Many cultures you go to, that's what you walk into every day. There's this tension everywhere you go, stress everywhere you go, people watching everywhere you go. But it's so it's hard to, to do this when you just live a life of luxury. And we live better than anybody else on the planet. So very hard to do in the wild, wild west, for sure. But if we do, here's what will happen. If we humble, if, if I'm humble, God will guide me. So this is a huge promise. If I'm humble, if I humble myself, God will guide me. He will guide you. In Psalm 25, 9, you see it there in your handout. God leads the humble in the right way and teaches them his will. So if I'm humble, I'm, I'm teachable. And therefore, you know, as the old saying goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And how does the te- how do we do that? We have to humble ourselves. I need help. Can you show me? Can you teach me? Can you help me? Live a Jesus-centered life. That's a requirement. Next, if I'm humble, God will bless me. So if I'm wanting God's blessing in my life, I have to be humble. I can promise you, everybody wants God's blessing. Everybody wants to have money and a place to live and be loved and have clean water and something to eat. And if we're in America, you're blessed, friends. I don't care what American you put. Native American, African American, Hispanic American, white American. It doesn't matter. If you live in America, you're blessed. Doesn't mean you don't have it as good as the guy across the street, but I can promise you, you need to go travel a little bit if you you think you you got it rough. We have it made compared to a lot of people. But if I'm humble, you know, God will bless me. We all want God's blessing. We all, we do. But are we willing to live into the premise? Because every promise has a premise. And there's a premise here. Isaiah 66, 2, you see it. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. This promise is throughout the entire Bible. Many said many different ways. There's thousands of promises in the Bible. 
This is just another one. Reminding us, though, how we have the premise, I have to be humble. If I'm not humble, none of this stuff materializes. None of it. That next one you don't have a slide for, but it says, if I humble, if I'm humble, God will give me grace. So that's the fill in for the next one. If I'm humble, God will fill, give me grace in my life. If I'm humble, God will give me the power to change. And how do I change? By God's grace. I don't have the power to fix myself. If I did, I would just fix myself. I would quit acting the way I quit. I wouldn't think the way I think. I wouldn't do the things I do. As Apostle Paul would say, why do I do the things I, I don't want to do and the things I do do I don't want to do? Why is it I do that? You know, but if I stay humble, God will give me the grace to have victory over that. But I've got to stay humble. James 4, 6 says, and you see it there in your handout, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if I want to receive God's grace, I have to remain humble. And, and proud equals pride equals ego equals self-righteousness. There's lots of names for it. So he's an egomaniac. Or as one person says, your ego is not your amigo. Right? It's another th- thing to think about. It's just th- th- God opposes the proud. Out of all of our sadly Devon sins, pride leads to procession. It's out in front. We're very prideful people. We are about everything. We're proud for Cardinals start this week. We're all excited about that. The city, St. Louis City, our soccer team, five and zero, oh, first time ever in history. I mean, all kinds of stuff that we take pride in. But we got to remain humble when it comes to life and give God all the glory. And most of us struggle with this. But if we want healing and restoration in our life, this is what God's asking of us. I mean, Scripture's really clear on these things. If I'm humble, God will relieve my stress. Do you need stress? You're stressed out? You ever said that? Man, I'm just stressed out. What's wrong with your sister? She's stressed out. You know, on down the line. We use this language all the time. Stress. Man, I'm stressed. I'm stressed. My schedule's killing me. These kids, running these kids all around, man, they're wearing me out. You know, we say, we, they would shake it as, I, I've been there, done that, brother. I relate to you. Uh, and uh, pray for you often, trust me. But uh, it, it, it is. We just get stressed out. But if I remain humble, well, God will give me victory over that stress. But I've got to remain in, in the right place, right? So, for, number one, I have to admit I'm not in control. And number two, I've got to ask for God's help. Really important. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take, Jesus says, this is Jesus speaking, I quote, Take the yoke I give you and learn from me. For I am gentle and I am humble and I will restore deep rest to your soul. End quote. God will relieve my stress if I'm in the right space. So condition number two, I have to ask for God's help. Honestly, how often do you do this? How often do you ask for God's help? Do you have to wait till your rear end falls off before you ask for God's help, right? Right, that the heat's really on you before you're really going to ask for God to step in. John 16, 23 and 24. See it there. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. My Father will give you anything you ask for in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive. So that you, your joy will be the fullest possible joy. This is what God is asking, right? Remember, Jesus wants me to ask. So we have to remember that. This is why we do all these things in Jesus' name. Why, do we, why does God want us constantly asking us to ask, 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 when he already knows what we want? It's a fair question. Why am I going to keep praying for forgiveness? Why am I going to keep asking for God's grace and mercy in my life if God already knows what I need before I ask? It's a great question. How do you answer that if a child or young adult is asking that question? Why do I got to keep asking and the answer is pretty simple, because God wants us to trust God. Just think about your own children when they're little, especially when they're really little. When they want something, what do they do? They cry, and they cry until they get it. And then we give it to them, and what do they begin to do? They begin to trust us. John and Christy just got a new 
are getting a new golden retriever. John told me they're going to name him Harold, which I'm pretty excited about. <laughs> finally, finally, even though it's an animal, we get the name Harold mixed in. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. But, but that animal, that new puppy in their life, will put its faith and trust in them. And it will continue to beg, and it will continue to ask, and will do that till it death does it part. This planet, it will continue to do that. Why? Because it trusts them that if I keep on, they will deliver on what I need. Well, that's exactly why we got to keep asking. And we ask in Jesus' name. That's why most of our prayers end that way. In your son's name, in the Lord's name, in your name, in Jesus' name, I pray these things. Ask in Jesus' name. So that's the conditions. So there's a lot of promises that come out of that. It truly is. A third one that's not in your bulletin, but I'll give it to you, is get the people to pray with you. Get people to pray with you. Really, really important to do that. Get people to pray with you in all ways. James says, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is any one unhappy? Let him sing song of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. So this is, again, the oil is not magic. It isn't magic oil. It's just nothing more than symbolism. When we anoint somebody in oil, which happens a lot in the hospital, it's, it's, there's nothing magic about that. The magic is the prayer. It's the power. Look inside your bulletins at today's quote from Max Licato. Read that quote. If you listen online, it's in the bulletin. It's in the bottom left-hand corner on the inside cover. That is a powerful, powerful quote, friends about what it means to pray. That when we pray, we aren't the ones with the power. All we're doing is the asking. God's got all the power. My job is just to ask. My job is just to pray for people. I got a list. It's in my bulletin. I take it home. People, places, circumstances that all need prayer. And our prayers are powerful. That's my part is to pray. To pray, to ask, and do so in Jesus' name. That's what we're asked to do. Number four is to, that I'll give you that's not in your bulletin, but is to believe and expect an answer. And if you're in the 40 days of prayer growth campaign and you're in the small group and you're going through the book, then the last few sessions, Pastor Rick in that study has hit on this. And he's defined gratitude, but then he defined it. I'll give it a word. He didn't give it this word, but I'll give it this word and call it faithitude. So gratitude, Pastor Rick would say, simply is the fact that I've prayed for something or I've been asking for something and it's materialized. You know, I prayed for sunshine and we got it. So now I'm grateful for sunshine. Gratitude. But faithitude is asking and, and thanking God before it ever happens. That's faith. So faithitude. That, I, you know, what's going on? This, the dog's a fine example. Don't have the dog yet, but I can be praying for the dog, the dog's well-being, its caretakers, its mother, um, all that, that it's healthy, it's vibrant. I can be praying for that before it ever happens. Faith it to you. That's faith. That's real faith. So praying for healing, praying for restoration before it ever materializes is where faith comes in. So number four is we believe and expect an answer. And that's, I think, really important. And so... Number, and number five, I'll give you that step and that promise that comes out of that is keep praying until God tells you to stop. Until God tells you to quit praying for something, just keep praying for it, whatever that is. My mother, Mama Long, I can promise you prayed for this boy for years before those prayers were answered. Years. And your mama, your daddy, the people that love you probably been praying for you for years. You got a troubled child. You got a troubled relationship. You got a troubled job situation. You got a troubled health problem. You got a troubled battle with your mind, with emotions, with just mental faculties, whatever. Keep praying. Just keep praying. 
but know that there's a premise that you've got to live into. Get other people to pray with you. This is why small groups are so important. It is. It just, you know, the 40 days of prayer, if you're in a small group, you know the power of that. By coming together and hearing from other people, learning from each other. And we're real intentional in our small group. We've got 21 people in it. But we pass the baton. So many different leading every week, you know. And we're just following the resources, following the outlines. So it's not rocket science. But, it's, but there's different voices taking us through different things. Everybody's sharing. We're all just one among many. And it's powerful. But we need to be able to go into spaces like that on a regular basis outside these growth campaigns just to be in small group, just to say, you know, here's what's going on. Good, bad, and ugly. Here's my joys. Here's my concerns. But here's my shortcomings. This is the junk we don't do very good at. But in our Methodist tradition, if we go back to the early days before any of this with John Wesley, you know, that's where this word Methodism comes out of. It's, it's this method. And this part of this method was class meetings, band meetings, they call them. They'd get together, they'd study God's word, but they'd also hold each other accountable. How's your week, John? How's it going, Rob? How's it going, Mike? How's it going, Dale? Some of you that have been on the walk to Emmaus and been a part of that movement. If you haven't, men or women, go. I'm telling you, it's a game changer. Even if you went 10 years ago, I would tell you to go back. You want a restoration in your faith, go to one of those walks. But even more important than the walk is the small groups that are really supposed to form out of that. That you have these bands and you meet on a regular basis. They give you a little bifold card with about six or seven questions in it. And, and it's all accountability. It's all this stuff we're talking about. It's, it's how to live in the premise to stay Jesus-centered, to stay Jesus-focused. Thy will not mine be done. Really, really important to do. So having people to get together to pray with is just highly important. Matthew 18, 19. You see it here on the screen. I tell you that if two of you on earth agree together about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Huge promise. So you don't need a bunch of people to pray. And be a leader when it comes to prayer. When you're out and about, you see somebody struggling, just walk up and say, can I pray for you? Do you need me to pray for you? What I, I do this a lot when we're out to eat. Especially if I'm by myself or just maybe one other person and we have a waiter or a waitress and it's not too crazy in her life. I'll just simply, hey, thanks for your service today. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And you'll be amazed what happens to that. Sometimes, no, I'm good. They don't even know how to respond to it. Other times, I'm like, yes. Yes. Some will be sarcastic. Say, you can pray I get out of here because I can't stand this thing. <laughs> but, but, but they'll ask. But some will just break down and cry on you. And, they, and they'll be like, I can't believe you just asked me that because I'm ready to jump off a cliff. So just asking people, inviting, and know that God's in that presence. So yeah, yeah is it nerve-wracking? Is it kind of fearful? Is it kind of crazy? Is it radical? Yes, but just try it and find out and watch how God shows up in that space. You're in the break room at the hospital. You're at your job. You're, you're anywhere. You just see somebody's got a lot of weight on their shoulders. You don't have to go up and go, hey, man, what's going on? You want to talk about it? That's a, you can, but you can also go up. It's obvious to me, that you're struggling. So you just let them know, I know you're struggling. Can I pray? Can we just pray together? And, you, and the power of that, it's, just, it's, it's huge. But we need that as much as we need to be receiving that, we need to be giving that in a big time. Ephesians 6.18, you see it here on the screen. Pray in the Spirit at all times, with all kinds of prayers. Ask me for all you need. To do this, you must be ready and never give up. Always pray for God's people. Right? So we believe and expect an answer. That's that faith of two. We just we pray, expecting God to respond. And if I'm rightly related to God, I can trust that promise. But there's the premise again. I have to be doing these things. Number three of the conditions in your handout at the top of the page on the right hand side. Seek God, not the miracle. Stop seeking the gift and start seeking. God, this is really hard for most of us because so many of us, we want God's blessing. You hear me talk about Zap theology. It goes on a lot of context, church context. Hey, if you don't know Jesus, put your hand up. Hey, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. 
come forward, we'll dunk you, we'll dip you, we'll sprinkle you. Some fashion, we're going to get you wet. But then you're baptized, and then we can say, we saved another soul this week. We can put it on our charts, we can put it on our Excel spreadsheet, we can report to the bishop, hey, another soul was saved. Then they go right out the door and they live like they've always lived. And then they get lost and they come back sometime later and say, I think I need to be rebaptized. I think I need to recommit myself to the Lord. And they want to get zapped. They want God's blessing in their life. The heat gets on. They walk out the door and all of a sudden the addiction's back. The problems are mounting up. The bank, there's more month left over than there is money. Whatever trial they're going through. And all of a sudden now I want, now I want a miracle. Now I want God to intervene. Now I'm desperate. And, and it's easy to do that. But God's telling us, friends, seek me, not the miracle. Seek me in a personal relationship without having a motive. How many times does somebody call, all of a sudden you see them on the caller ID or you get a Facebook message or they text you or all of a sudden they pull up in your driveway. Oh, I wonder what he wants or she wants. I haven't seen them in a while. And they come in and they say, hey man, I thought I'd stop by. And then all, you know, after 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes comes the real reason why we were there. Oh, and by the way, I want to know if you can help me move. Or I want to know if you can spot me at 20 until next week. Or I want to know if I can borrow this or that. And the real motive wasn't to spend time with you. The real motive was they needed something from you. And I think if we're really honest, that's how we go to God a lot. We go to God seeking to borrow something, to get something, and not really seeking to spend time with God. And so this is what God is asking from us. This is part of the premise. So Proverbs 8.17 says, I have those who love me and those who seek me to find me. I love those who do that. And that's what God wants from us. Just to seek, honestly seek God. Just an intimate relationship with God. Hebrews 11.6 says this, God rewards those who earnestly seek Him. God rewards those. You see that in your handout. I would encourage you to circle the word earnestly. Seek. Seek. That's what we're asked to do. Psalm 14.2 says this. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if there is even one with real understanding. One who seeks for God. So God knows we have ulterior motives. God knows that we just want His blessing. That we just want our bank situation, our finances straightened out, or our marriage straightened out, or, you know, I'm tired of our health straightened out. We want victory over our health problems or our mental faculties or whatever. We want our child to straighten out. We want our husband to start acting right. Not looking at you on purpose, Mark. We're just looking at him. But, you know, we want things. And God says, I just for once want to look down and just see somebody who's seeking me because they want to seek me. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 29 through 31. That's the way it says. If you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. Your soul being made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For he is merciful God. He will not abandon you or Destroy you. End quote. Seek. Honestly. Seek God. Big difference between asking for a favor, needing a blessing. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be given to you as well. What a tremendous promise. So how do you seek first his kingdom? Well, we talked about it last week, so I would encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message again on how to, to use the model of the Lord's Prayer as a way to pray throughout the day. Is that, that we seek by, by spending the majority of our time seeking a relationship with God. We have the world system and we have the kingdom of God. Two different things. Jesus says, my kingdom is for not of this world. 
we are to live in the kingdom. We are kingdom builders. It's part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. It's, it's our purpose statement. We are Jesus helping. We are people helping people experience a Jesus-centered life. The Methodist mission statement is simply, we are people, we make disciples who make disciples for the transformation of the world. You know, this is what we're about. There's purpose to our life. We're about to expand the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But it's easy to get caught in the world system and we're worried about what's the next series we're going to watch on Netflix or Prime or Apple or Hulu or any of those shows. What are we going to watch next? You know, what time's the game on today? We worry about our season tickets and what we're going to eat and where we're going to go on vacation this summer. And we spend hours scrolling the internet trying to put all that stuff together. And, and Jesus tells us, seek the kingdom first and foremost in your life. Lastly, the fourth condition Turn my attention from the world to the Word. Turn my attention from the world to the Word. And there's, in our scripture reading today, there's a word that says, and turn from their wicked ways. And so we want to lift up that definition. What does wickedness mean? And it's easy to, if I just gave you that as just a blank essay question, write your definition of wickedness. It's murder, it's rape, it's espionage, it's theft, it's thievery, it's gossip, all those things. No, the biblical definition of wickedness is forgetting God. It's just living for my own self-interest. I only bring God into the equation when I am totally powerless. But as long as i got a little bit left in the tank, I don't need you guys. It's like God's a Bush League pinch hitter. He's in the dugout. He's in the bullpen. God, this is getting deep. Come on out. I'll hand the ball off to you now. You know what I'm saying? That's what happens. And so that word wicked is uh, important to uh, know. Isaiah 17.10 tells us, You have forgotten the God who saves you, and you have not remembered that God is your place of safety. So we're walking around all stressed out, all freaked out, worried about this, can't sleep, staying up all night, walking, pacing the floor, eating more food than we need to, watching more TV than we need to, caught up in a pornography habit, this, that, or the other, all these worldly things, trying to deal with the stresses of life instead of just seeking God. This is what we do. This is what humans do, even Christians. And we're called to repent from that. We're called to turn from that. Acts 3.19 says... Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So in Hebrew, that word, that Hebrew word there for turn means repent. It means turn a different direction. In Greek, that word turn is metanoia. Meta means to turn. Noia is the mind. Basically it means to flip the mind. You get, or Paul would say it, you've got to have a renewal of the mind. In recovery circles, they might say you need an entire psychic change. But whatever's going on between your ears needs to be restored. But there's the premise. I have to repent. So I've I got to remember God, number one, and then I've got to repent. So as we say in our Roman series, we have to exercise our faith and we have to exercise repentance. That's the premise. We want these promises in our life then we have to get, engage the premise. All of us want the promise. Most of us don't want the premise. Because we have to die to ourselves. We have to come to the end of ourselves and we don't want to do it. Proverbs 28, 13 says, If you hide your sins, you will not succeed. But if you confess and reject them, you will receive mercy. So, you've all heard the statement a million times, you're as sick as your secrets. And most people... Even in Christian circles, spiritual circles, I don't care what the spirituality, whether it's recovery, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever, doesn't matter. Most people live by the 80-20 rule. They'll tell you about 80% of what's really going on in their life, but the other 20% is off limits. It's almost like we've got an unwritten rule, even in Christian circles, even in our churches, even in our small groups sometimes. You tell me about your 80%, I'll tell you about mine. Don't ask me about my 20, and I won't ask you about your 20. And it's kind of a handshake. 
And so we're sick as our secrets. We're, we're stuck in that space, friends. And that space is an unhealthy space. God says, if you want healing, if you want restoration, then confession needs to be a regular part of who you are. And if you're in a small group, that's easy. If you have a mentor, that's easy. In recovery circles, they really promote sponsorship. You know, so it's almost a prerequisite. You're going to be in recovery, you've got to have a sponsor. We don't do such a good job of that in, in Christian circles or religious circles with mentorship. It's available, but most people don't. It's a foreign subject for the most part. But being in a small group, just having six to eight, maybe ten people tops that you're with, you're sharing on a regular basis, even if it's bi-weekly, even if it's just a couple times a month. You know, the, as you stay there, you start to build trust and you start to become vulnerable and you can just be real. Here's what's going on. I'm struggling at home a little bit with my bride. I'm struggling a little bit with our money. I'm struggling a little bit with this, that, or the other. I got some doubts about my faith. I got questions. I'm struggling why God would allow this to happen to somebody I care so much about. But you have those spaces to be able to ask those questions. Really, really important. James 5.16 says, and you see it there in your outline, Therefore, confess your sins with each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. Circle the word healed. If you want to be healed and restored, this is part of the premise. And if you're not doing these things, we'll read what the scripture said. The bottom line is, and I, you can write this in, I need help to change. And I always will need help to change. I need help to change. But here's the three promises that I'll leave you with as we close out today. And they're from our text that we started out with, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. But if we do with every promise, there's a premise. And if we live into the premise, then God will keep his promises. And here are the three promises. Number one, I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. These won't be on the screen. I'll just give them to you to fill in. Number two, I will forgive your sins. And lastly, number three, I will heal your land. You look at our country. Does our country, the United States, need a spiritual awakening? All this premise has to happen. We can pray all day long that we want America, God bless America. We can sing it to our eyes cross. But if we're not willing to live into the premise, don't expect a whole lot. Other than what God said to the Israelites. That if you want to worship other gods and go do whatever it is you want to do, I'm out. And so if, the, if, the, if, the world, if America collapses, it's hard to look at it and say that it's possible. But if you study history, the, an average empire only lasts about 250 years. And America is almost 250 years old. The Roman people didn't think the Roman Empire would ever fall. Babylonians didn't think the Babylonian Empire would ever fall. Trust me, things change. But if you're outside the will of God, whether you're an individual, a country, a community, whatever, God says, I'm out. If you're not going to live into the premise, then the promise isn't going to happen, and you get what you get. So that's where we're at, friends. So yes, we need to pray for our country, our community, our leaders, everything we lifted up in our pastoral prayer. We need to pray for all that stuff, and we need to pray boldly, but we need to be a light and help other people Live into the premise. We've got to share the premise. Not just, hey, Jesus loves you. But Jesus loves you and wants you to repent. Wants you to turn from your wicked ways. Start living for God's interest instead of your own. This starts in our own families. With our own kids and grandkids. And immediate family. And then our network of friends and our co-workers and our neighbors. It starts there. You don't need a megaphone. You need to live by example. You need to invite people on this journey. That's what we're called to do. But if we do it, we can expect to be healed and restored from the things that are holding us back. Amen. So with that, I'm going to invite the band back up. We're going to pray. I'll invite you to stand as we pray. And I invite you to pray for healing and restoration in your life. But also pray for the willingness, the open-mindedness, and the honesty it's going to take to live into the premise for this healing and restoration to materialize in your life. We all need that, big time. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we admit we are not in control. 
We give you all the glory. You are in control. You are the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God that we turn our will and life over to. That is where we stand today. And we humbly want to walk in your path. We want to live a Jesus-centered life. We know that requires humility on our part. We don't always have it, Lord, so we're praying for you to intervene. We're praying for your Holy Spirit to help us do what we seem to struggle to do ourselves, to humble ourselves so that we can have your blessings, so that we can be healed, so that we can be restored. God, give us the willingness to seek you just for the sake of seeking you, not with all these ulterior motives or needing something in return, just to seek you to to be with you. Help us to have the power to do that, Lord. And, and Lord, help us turn our attention from the dark world that we live in to your word on a regular basis, throughout our day, every day, one day at a time. We pray all these things, Lord, and we pray them boldly in your son's name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. This is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, We are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, or you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, and, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www.hilltran.com Dot org for more information and to give. We appreciate anything you can do to help. Hey, thanks for being a member of this extended church family. I'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of God.